Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. Hey folks, it is Shay here, and thank you again for joining me for another episode of Casual Cattle Conversations. Today, we will be diving into the finances of ranching. So I will be visiting with John Haskell of Ranch Right LLC. That is his business or company. And we are going to be talking about kind of some common financial mistakes, what cattle producers can do to clean up their finances and kind of get over the overwhelm that sometimes they can create. And we're also going to share some resources for you that will hopefully help you yourself and your family or whatever operation you're on get a better grasp on understanding finances when it comes to ranching and accounting and how you can do a better job of understanding those, um, reducing the stress around them, and just being better operators in general so that you can enjoy what you're doing even more. So in addition to that, I do want to remind you to go take a look at the quarter four rancher mind program. So rancher minds is a membership area for podcast listeners, anyone in the beef industry who wants to improve how they're managing their operations. And so this is an opportunity for you as cattle producers to connect with other cattle producers and industry experts Um, really anytime you want, but we have monthly Q and a calls and that's really the events where you get to ask any question you want to the experts I'm having on there. And quarter four is going to be focused on business management in the beef cattle industry. So go check that out. Um, that's in the show notes, or you can go to my website, casualcattleconversations.com. But with that, let's get on with today's episode. There are lots of nutrition tubs out there, but none can match the true blue commitment of Vitalix. Our tubs offer you the most concentrated nutrition at the lowest cost per day. That means more profit for your operation and improved performance for your cow herd. In fact, research shows Vitalix tubs increase feed efficiency by 20% while boosting conception rates, herd health, and weaning weights. Learn more at Vitalix.com. Vitalix, the true blue tub. Well, John, it is great to have you on the show today. I know business and finance. That's really a topic that my listeners maybe don't like to do themselves, but they recognize it's important. And I myself am the same way. So I'm excited to have you on and visit about that. And before we dive into that conversation, would you talk a little bit about your background in the ranching industry, beef cattle industry, and why you started Ranch Right LLC? You bet. So there are a couple of uh, fun things. I'm going to start at a bit of a turning point. Uh, there was a point where I got to see a profitable ranch. And the first one I saw, I think she saw two in fairly close succession. The first one I saw didn't really make sense to me. Uh, I, I heard that it was profitable. I saw grass everywhere. It was kind of hard to find cows because they were all way over in one corner of the ranch. I, that didn't make any sense. Uh, and I, I just remember, you know, there was grass everywhere. Um, I went to college actually with the idea of not having much to do with ranching um, and wound up working under a guy who was a science advisor for the Malpai Borderlands group. And through him, got to see uh, some of the country in Southwest New Mexico down around the Gray Ranch uh, where they had been practicing HMI type principles, you know, holistic management principles uh, for, uh, you know, quite a while at that point in the late 90s. And uh, then shortly after that, he shipped me off to a deal uh, on one of the ranches owned by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Utah, the Deseret Land and Livestock Ranch. And same picture, right? There's all this grass everywhere. There are a couple of employees who don't seem like they're doing a lot. The ranch has been profitable at that point, had built like a 20-year track record of being at, you know, at least nominally profitable. And uh, I decided, you know, kind of then and there, I, I needed to know a lot more about this. So that led, that led to a a job basically. So did you grow up in the beef industry? I did not. My, my, my dad's a mechanic. I grew up around farming and ranching, but not in it. Okay. So back to ranch, right? Is that your own company that you started then? Correct. Yeah. So uh, I did a number of things in ranching, but uh, decided to start this company primarily by looking at a a whole series of places that all had very common problems. And one thing I was uh, very surprised by, um, but also took a while to sort of percolate the importance of it, 
when I went to work uh, for the Deseret Ranch, um, they are very open with their financials with their employees. And one of the things that became pretty quickly apparent is that not only did the employees know what the financials were, uh, but the company did, you know, the people making management decisions did. And it became pretty obvious very quickly that one of the biggest differences between the way a lot of small operators run and the way some of these bigger places run is that is that sort of knowledge of what's going on financially. I was very lucky. There was a guy named Mike Meek, who was the cattle foreman there at the time, who is uh, real, real good in a lot of these areas. And he made it very clear early on that, you know, we have a there are two sets of books and and maybe even three um, in the real world, right? There's a tax set of books, which is one thing. And a lot of people are very focused on, but then there's also a management set of books. And frankly, there's, you know, there's a whole nother part of this that relates to banking, which is a different thing that isn't very important in their system, but is important for the rest of us. Um, and so understanding, you know, sometimes when we hear people talk about having two sets of books, right, we're talking about people that are committing fraud, uh, and and that's not at all what we're talking about. But there are using the same numbers and looking at financials is very context dependent. So there is a set of rules that governs tax, for example, uh, and there is a set of rules that governs management. And because those rules are different, we use this, you know, basically the same numbers, but in a different way uh, to develop a full understanding of where we stand with regard to those things. So. The area we work in is management accounting. We we don't tax is not a focus. Uh, we work with tax preparers, you know, to make sure compliance is achieved. Uh, but the most important thing we're looking for are the, are the financial numbers within someone's business that help them understand whether they should be doing more of something or less of something, or kind of whether they're on the right track. So. Before we dive deeper into that conversation, I do want to go back to what you said, where you said the employees knew the finances of the operation. Would you say when you were around those types of operations that those employees worked better? Like what was the impact of making sure that the, like the purpose of having the employees know the finances, what were the impacts because they knew those yeah, so when we deal with employees, right, we often think about we often think about costs. And uh, Burke Tykert and a number of others do a great job of talking about having a war on costs. Well, if I'm an employee of a company and I don't have any idea what anything costs or how much we're spending or anything like that, my ability to have any kind of input or impact on that is quite low. When we went through and looked at the numbers, right, we we knew what the cost of feeding animals was, right? We knew what the cost of fuel was to run our pickups. We knew what the cost of the pickups, the repairs and maintenance, all that stuff. If I'm not entirely a believer in the you can't, you know, you you can't uh, change what you don't measure. You know, this is a phrase that's kind of batted around. There are plenty of things you can't measure that um, that are you know valuable or meaningful or impactful in your business, but the the contrary often isn't true, right? If I expect an employee to be careful about costs and I don't ever tell him what the costs are, right? That really kind of puts a person in a bad position. They're at a real disadvantage. Where if I say, look, you know, for good, bad, or otherwise, it costs us $400 a year to put fuel in your pickup. Uh, then suddenly the employee or or really anyone at any level in the corporation, right? Or in the, in the operation uh, has the ability to, you know, to sort of think about that as you're going. And I think let, there are two parts to this. One, of course, is if you know enough about the specifics, you actually have maybe an opportunity to, to even look for um, places to improve. Uh, but the other is I, I thoroughly believe there's, and, and the organization there does also, there's huge power in the team. Uh, I, as the leader of my organization, I'll claim I have some good ideas. Uh, but I don't have all the good ideas. And I really want to get the, you know, the people that work for me with me also thinking about these same problems, because in our case, as a group of eight, we often come up with a much better solution than any one of us would come up with on our own. Uh, and so again, giving that level of visibility sort of leverages both of those things at the same time. Thank you for going into that and explaining that. You bet. So Going back to Ranch Right, and you said there's two types of book, books, and you focus on management accounting, correct? Correct. 
So then what are the three biggest mistakes you see cattle producers or ranchers make, I guess, whichever they want to call themselves when it comes to management accounting? So I would love to tell you that the biggest mistake they make is that they don't share enough financial information with their employees so their employees can help them make their operation better. Uh, But the single biggest mistake is nobody knows what their financials are. Right. The, the, if we ordered these, and and I'm going to just say that that's the overarching one. If we ordered these, we would say their financials are too oriented towards tax, right? But the real problem is nobody really knows. I say nobody. But I, when I say nobody, I mean let's take 90 percent of operators have no idea what their financials are in real time. Uh, there's a guy from down by Wheatland who talks about you know, ranching at the speed of commerce. And I've been making this parallel lately, which I I hope makes sense. Uh, If I am driving down the road on Interstate 90 and my, I get to look through the windshield once every 90 seconds, that is going to produce a less desirable driving experience than if I'm looking through the window every five seconds, which is going to produce a less desirable outcome than if I'm looking out every second. If I only looked at the road 16 months after I had been there, my ability to drive would be, you know, just, it it wouldn't exist, right? I couldn't get anywhere. I would would be one accident after another. Uh, If I look out the front window and only get a view of what I just passed 90 seconds ago, right, that wouldn't give me any information for going forward. And and the biggest single thing we do is we don't have any framework for putting our financials in. A lot of us are good at keeping receipts and all that. Some of us even know some of the costs of a few things, but we don't have the kind of picture that gives us the ability uh, to take action. And it's the taking action part that's so critical. There are a few pieces to taking action. The first one is actually the information itself. Most ranches are comprised of three to five enterprises, right? So you might have, you might run cows and calves, stockers, and you might cut hay. Uh, if you're a farm, you may have corn, soybeans, and and uh, winter wheat, right? I mean, you know, we have all these different, we do different stuff. Very few ranches are one thing and one thing only. And even if you just have a cow-calf herd, Oftentimes you have sort of sub enterprises within there, right? You have steer calves and heifer calves, and you might sell some bread cows, you might sell some bulls, that sort of thing. Anyway, one one thing we need to be able to do in those in these sort of operations, which are uh, which are encompass sort of s- smaller sub enterprises, if you will, is figure out which ones work and which ones don't. Most of the time, when I look at a ranch with three to five enterprises. There is an absolute thoroughbred in there, and there might be one or more just real losers or what I call dogs. So there's there. Let's just say if you've got five enterprises, one of them's a thoroughbred, one of them's a dog. Now I'm not saying you only want to do the one enterprise, but if you did nothing other than get rid of the loser, you would probably save yourself a bunch of time and make more money. Diversification has a lot of really positive. Um, and, and even powerful impacts. But a lot of times we are diversified because we don't know what to do. We don't actually know what's working. And because we don't know what's working, we wind up chasing a bunch of things that really don't move the needle very much. Most ranches for ecological and financial and even uh, sort of social reasons need to do a couple of different things. Uh, but I've become a real sort of anti-advocate for some of the stuff that people like Joel Salatin promote. And and I don't have any problem with Joel Salatin. That's, I don't mean to start any kind of argument there, but sometimes people hear somebody like Joel Salatin talk and they think, well, I need to raise chickens and pigs and calves and replacement heifers. And I'm going to sell, you know, sows and I'm going to run turkeys for, you know, I mean, they just wind up in this spiral of, you know, sort of Uh, work that grows as an exponential rate with returns that grow at a, you know, maybe even sublinear rate, right? The returns just don't keep up with all of the effort and the complexity. One of the things I learned while working for the LDS church is the power of focus. Uh, They knew very much what they were good at, 
and they did that. So much more akin to the strategy of put all your eggs in one basket and then guard that basket with a machine gun. Now we are we are very much subject to vagaries of weather, vagaries of markets, those sorts of things. Like that is part of the environment we operate in. But if we are truly the best in a particular area, we probably ought to focus on that. Uh, and and that ties in with the philosophy that you know there are people that tell you that oh you should really work on your weaknesses and get better at that and that'll help you, and then there are other people that say no 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 don't focus on your weaknesses focus on your strengths. And I think both of those are a little extreme. We probably, you know, if we have fatal weaknesses, we probably need to make sure we're paying attention to those things. But generally, I think not fighting the things that aren't working is a better strategy than, and trying to get better at the things that we are good at uh, tends to produce better results, more happiness, that sort of thing. So with with that, um, you know, again, the big the biggest mistake, we don't know where we stand. OK, John. So that was the first biggest mistake was not knowing your direction, not knowing your finances. What is that second biggest mistake? The, the second biggest mistake ties back to what we were talking about with regard to these enterprises. Um, and I think working within your strengths is a very important thing. We, you know, traditionally, uh, frequently, the bookkeeping is done by either someone's wife or someone's mom. So you've got a ranch wife, she's responsible for a bajillion things plus doing the bookkeeping. We see lots of cases where that is a highly qualified person that does a fantastic job. We see a bunch of places where that just falls to them because they happen to be close to the house, you know, either because of kids or school or their other job or whatever. Um, working with the idea, again, of working in your expertise um, I feel like a lot of times that is not a great use of people's time. We're going to talk a little more about this basic concept later, but as a comparison, uh, I've got a kid that works on our team that does this, you know, 10 hours a day, five to five to six days a week. He's done it for a number of years. He has a degree in accounting. He has a CPA. He is really good at this. Um, and he does it all day long, every day. So unlike the average person who kind of has to figure out how to reconcile their accounts over and over again every month, uh, he know, you know, he, he just does it. Um, leveraging the power of an expert um, is a big mistake in record keeping. Uh, where we focus with our record keeping, um, and maybe this goes to number three a little bit, um, but we focus our the structure of our record keeping so that we can answer critical questions. And, you know, it's it's all well and good to get all of the receipts entered correctly. You know, so I spent ten dollars and fifty three cents on fuel on X day, blah, blah, blah. That's all important. But what really makes the difference is how you structure the data. And we structure the data specifically to answer questions. Most people are worried about, you know, getting the categories broken down. So is this, you know, is this dyed fuel or is this road fuel or, uh, you know, what 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 do we put all these different things into categories on? Those, those categories, of course, are important, but what's way more important is do those categories help us answer questions that then lead to action? And the um, action part, as I mentioned before, I, th I think I said that before, is really the most important part. When our data is telling us something, we need to make a change uh, or, or, or we need to stay the course if that's what the data is telling us to do. But we need to be able to act accordingly. And if we've categorized things based on you know, what the item is, as opposed to some function in the financial part of the business, We've, we've actually made a mistake. And most of the time we've made our life harder. I'll use an example. We often take over other people's uh, QuickBooks accounts and they will have multiple categories of things that are you know, basically office supplies. So they might have a category for envelopes and a category for stamps and a category for printer paper, printer ink, right? It is incredibly easy in most accounting software to continue creating new accounts. I have never seen our ranch go bankrupt because they bought too many stamps, right? It just isn't, a, it, it, that's just not a, there, there's no reason to create a separate category because that separate category creates extra work and provides no information. When we categorize things, we do it very pragmatically to say, okay, how does, how does this affect our operation? And if our operation is not functioning correctly, do we have some idea of what we would change? So if my ranch isn't making money, 
the first place I'm not going to look is at my stamp expenditure because that's probably not the problem, right? It's probably a number that's far too small to even worry about. And it's just not something, I mean, I can't tell you, you know, I can't send out a different number of checks, right? I, I have to send out checks for the transactions. Those go with a stamp. That's kind of the best predictor. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. The the final piece of all of this that, that, that it adds together, and this is what we really focus on is then confidence. So if I don't have any numbers, or I don't know what my numbers are, then I'm not confident in them. If I've if I've not set them up in a way that I can actually analyze them and get some meaningful data, you know, meaningful metrics, if you will, out of them, then they don't help me move forward. And the, and the last thing that often comes from having an expert involved is that, and and we all make mistakes, so that's not quite what we're talking about. But having an understanding of this is what the numbers are telling us, and we feel confident in them to make the change. So if I have an enterprise that doesn't appear to be making money, I may have a gut feeling that it's not making money. That is my gut feeling enough for me to actually take action? Well, if I have a gut feeling that I'm not making any money and at a particular enterprise and my financials tell me that, well, now I've got sort of two votes, if you will, against it. That often helps people make the change that they need to make. Now we again, they're always mistakes are a part of the deal. So we also try to structure the data so that we are more focused on being accurate than we are on being precise, right? We we probably are off by dollars and cents here and there, but we're getting at the correct overall picture of the business. So if if cutting hay is where, you know, if if the hay business is where my profit is at, I want to see that reflected in multiple metrics, if you will. And then those multiple metrics combined with my gut feeling that, yeah, well, this hay business really feels like it's working, uh, that helps us maybe devote more resources, maybe gives us confidence to lease another place, uh, right? Maybe gives us confidence to invest in irrigation infrastructure, do those things that will increase our output on that particular enterprise. Hey folks, if you're enjoying this episode with John and you want to take your cattle operation to the next level by running it like a business, then you need to check out the Quarter 4 Rancher Mind series. So in October, November, and December, I'm going to be connecting you with industry experts and peer ranchers who can help you clean up your finances, understand your finances, set goals, create strategic plans, look at alternative funding options, um, and even look at alternative revenue sources. So if you want to do this and you want to walk out the door each day with confidence in what you're doing and why you're doing it and knowing that you're running a successful business, then go to the show notes and you can register with a link there. And if you want more information, head to my website. There's also a link in the show notes. And on the contact us page, you can send me a message and just say you want more Rancher Mind info and I'll send it your way and we'll have a conversation about it. With that, let's get back to the episode. Okay, so thank you for talking about those top three mistakes. Now, I think it's easy for cattle producers, or maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but I don't really think I am, to get a little overwhelmed by the thought of cleaning up finances, especially if you know people have been in it for years and they know they have a mess and where do you start? So what advice do you have for people to start making that process where they can start cleaning up their finances and can start finding that direction again? This is a, this is a, like a question of the day in our operation, because I, there is some value in cleaning up finances. I think frankly, the, the biggest value is in as much as you can responsibly, uh, sort of dynamiting whatever you're doing and just starting over, starting fresh, right? Now, obviously, you know, we don't get to get rid of our liabilities. We don't get to get rid of a whole bunch of, you know, things with tax consequences, et cetera. But there's a certain point where we could spend an incredible amount of time going backwards and quote unquote, cleaning things up. What we really need to do is figure out what we've got to do going forward, put a good system together, put a good team in place, and then get after it. And it's amazing to me how quickly... We, so we used to, uh, and, and we still do periodically, sort of go back, clean up people's finances, and then go forward from there. And there is value in that. But most of the time, the value of the cleanup compared to the effort required, it's just not what's done is done, right? Just time to move on. Now, uh, we have this debate about, do you look past? Do you look future? Blah, blah, blah. What we really want to do is be as present as possible, right? In the current as we can. 
Uh, there are times, for example, at this time of year, right, we're seven months into the year, we kind of need to get the year's picture put together. So we might go back to January quite confidently, but we're probably not going to go back to 2019, right? We're just we're just going to let let those things be gone. And as far as the feeling of overwhelm when we are starting over again, I think that comes from having a framework in which to put financial information. One of the things I love about the ranching for profit system is that their focus on grow, what they call gross margins, we'll call gross profit, um, is, is a very clear system. It gives some really good, uh, there's some great references there, kind of some benchmarks that we can compare to. And it doesn't involve us having to know everything about the whole business uh, to start to look at the differences between enterprises. The other thing that um, I like to, again, when we're talking overwhelm, and, and so when I think overwhelm, I think, okay, how simple can we make it? Uh, we look at two important ratios related to debt that I think often correlate very, very well with how people are sleeping and how they're getting along with their spouse. So when debt is you know, sort of overwhelming, it tends to affect a lot of personal relationships. It tends to affect how we sleep, right? Those are just when I'm, you know, if I'm having financial troubles, I'm the kind of person that's awake at two in the morning thinking about it, right? I think I think a lot of us are that way. Uh, when we add that level of stress to our life, often it impacts our family relationships. And a lot of times what we see is that there are, uh, you know, when we have a married couple, we have two people maybe with a different tolerance for risk, a different uh, belief about how much cash ought to be in the checking account, right? A belief about debt, those sorts of things. And those two things are often different. And when they are different and there is, you know, everything's going well, the difference isn't that important. But when they're different and things aren't going well, then that's usually what sort of compounds any other, uh, you know, interpersonal problems you might be having. So debt coverage is a ratio that we talk a lot about. That is literally the, the your ability to make the payments on your long-term debt. And those payments are, of course, made out of profits, you know, or net income from the ranch. Uh, and then working capital. And working capital is liquidity, right? It's a, some people talk about current ratio um, or a quick ratio. We do those things in dollars because the ratios can be a little deceiving sometimes. Um, but when we look at those two numbers, you know, if we look at gross margins on one side and we look at uh, those two numbers regarding debt on the other side, we can usually get a pretty good feel very quickly for where things are at. If you're in a position where you literally can't pay your mortgage, um, you know, we can debate about gross margins all we want, but it doesn't really matter. Um, if we're in a position where we have no liquidity, right? Same same issue. Like, well, we may want to do all kinds of things, but our choices are severely limited. Once we have those things kind of under our belts, we're able to do that with some regularity, then we can really look at how do we tune up the business so that it performs at a higher level, you know, gives us more, oper you know, even greater opportunity to service debt, for example, greater opportunity to support our family, greater security into the future. Um, you know, that's that's kind of the fun part that we all like to get to. But sometimes we have to deal with the crisis first. So when we're talking about knowing our finances, what accounting principles or bookkeeping principles do ranchers need to have a solid grasp on to be successful at this and know the direction they can go? Good. So we're going to we're going to I want to draw a clear line between two things, the things that you should know. And then the things that you probably should outsource. Uh, funny enough, we have a number of clients who are accountants, uh, which always kind of cracks me up. But most ranchers aren't accountants. Most ranchers don't get into the business uh, of ranching so that they can save receipts and put make Excel spreadsheets and you know do all these kinds of things. Uh, most ranchers ranch because they like ranching. Um, ranching involves a business side also. And if you are not expert in that, I strongly recommend that you build a team. I, we're going to talk more about that after this, but there are still some important principles that I think one should know. We talked about gross margins and, uh, debt coverage ratio. I think having a very firm understanding of the very basic principles of 
business. And I, I, I struggle a little to define exactly what that is, but it, at some level, we all have to have an underlying theory about what creates value and what puts money in our pocket. And we hear a lot in the industry about that is, a, that is very asset centered and assets are wonderful. Don't get me wrong, but the, you know, we, we all are familiar with the, uh, you know, the saying about being rich on paper and poor at the bank, right? Uh, that is a very common situation. Um, what we need to understand, I think more than anything, and we need to avoid is what's called the materialistic or the physical fallacy. Resources in and of themselves do not generate wealth. Uh, most of us think about gold, silver, you know, tall office buildings, right? Big herds of cows, big herds of sheep. Those are the things which generate wealth. And I'm going to argue that from a philosophical standpoint, that is not correct. It is the application of what we can call intellectual capital or, you know, some sort of intellectual resource to that underlying asset that is what generates wealth. I don't, just because I own a herd of cows, doesn't mean I'm going to be successful in business. Uh, we all know people who own the cows outright, own the land outright, and still can't make a living, right? We all know people who've had an oil well drilled on their place, and it's produced a huge influx of cash, and then a few years later, they go broke. Um, it is, it is, those assets aren't the important thing. What really matters is how what we do with them, how we apply what we know about, about livestock management, about nutrition, about marketing, about grazing management. Those are the things that make the real difference. I, I, um, a, a focus on assets is important. Understanding asset management is important, but I think our, a correct philosophy about what generates wealth um, is also very important. The other thing that I preach to people all the time and, and uh, talk about a lot is that cash is king and cash comes from cash flow. And so it's wonderful to have and control all these things, uh, but we see people all the time that have these things but can't pay to keep them. Uh, if I have a gold bar in my desk drawer, which I don't have, just in case anybody's going to break into my desk, but if I had one, all I would have to do is keep it in that desk drawer. If I have cattle outside or I have steers in a yard or you know any sort of live resource, it actually costs money every day to keep that thing alive, right? There is either a direct feed input or a care or a mortgage payment or something that has to be made with that. And if I stay pretty cash flow focused as the primary part of primary activity in my business, uh, that allows me then to pay my bills, which allows me to accumulate more assets, which allows me to, um, you know, sort of continue operating into the future, which is the, always the challenge, right? What do I, what do I have to do in order to do this one more day, one more year, you know, one more generation? The other part of the cash flow focus, and maybe I, it helps if I draw a distinction. So we could have cash flow focus or appreciation focus. Um, appreciation uh, meaning, you know, buying something and hoping it's going to go up in value. Um, the beautiful thing about cash flow focus is that it often is at least largely independent of appreciation. So I don't have to predict markets. I often, if I am very cash flow focused, I can be pretty independent of markets. So if I, you know, if I'm doing this correctly, the markets can go up and down and my income stream can stay about the same. We referenced some things related to debt earlier in our conversation. And of course, debt service ultimately is a function of cash flow. If I have a mortgage and my real estate appreciates, it does not help me pay the mortgage unless I sell the real estate. You can argue or refinance it. Yeah, sure. But it's still, you haven't actually repaid it, right? You've just kicked the can down the road. But in, in all senses, it is income that provides repayment ability. And that's that's the key in my mind to staying in the game over the long term. So then who does need to be on that financial team so that cattle producers can outsource certain yep. parts of their finances? Yeah, very 
Very good. The financial team is made up of a couple of different parts, and this is one some people don't quite appreciate. The bookkeeping is one very specific part, literally tracking the receipts, tracking the individual expenses, hanging those into a framework where we can start to see the business. Uh, the the There are two sides of that, of course. Tax is one side. Uh, and usually having a dedicated tax professional um, is a great idea. And then and then the management side is the other, right? So uh, this is a stat I love to repeat. There's a, There was a recent study done. Um, we like to think our industry is unique. Recent study done of accounting firms. Turns out in the US and the UK and Canada, uh, like some huge number, and I think it's 50% of accounting firms don't actually generate an economic profit, right? Which is pretty fun. That's like, what? First of all, it's a much easier business to be in than ranching as an example, because you don't have weather. Uh, the market is pretty stable. Uh, the the asset, you know, takes like a computer and some software, and the software is expensive, but not that expensive. And then there's a bunch of labor, and it, it illustrates two things. The first one is there is um, a lot of misunderstanding about business, and much of it is held by accounting accountants, just the same way it is by ranchers. Most accountants don't understand business any more than ranchers do. Um, but it also shows that just because you have all the accounting done, it doesn't, that doesn't mean you're going to be successful either. Right. Um, and so having someone who understands, you know, sort of business finance and, and it, more like a CFO, um, is, a, that's a huge ad, right? Because again, most of us as individuals don't have that understanding. Most of us as ranchers aren't trained in that. Uh, when, when I have people ask us, you know, so, the neighbor's place is for sale. Should we buy it? Um, most of us are guessing, right? Most of us don't really know. You could ask your accountant and your accountant could tell you the tax implications, um, but very few accountants could tell you the repayment and the production implications. And so having that type of financial advice would be, in my mind, the third leg. Um, account, this is a fun one. You know, Again, most accountants that prepare taxes don't actually know how to do bookkeeping. Uh, lots of bookkeepers don't know how to do tax and and many managerial accounts don't know how to prepare tax returns right so in that just in that one slice of your business you actually need or you would be well served often by multiple experts within our firm we have different people that specialize in those different things uh and again with us with a real recognition that as a team we provide a much better product than as an individual when we when we talk about the the ranch, you know, and having a series of advisors, uh, Mary Jo Arman speaks really well about this. Does a beautiful job of sort of making a list, and I think you've had her on your mm -hmm. podcast. I don't believe it was on yours where she talked about this, but she's talked about this openly a number of times. So there, you know, the financial people are one side, legal is another side. Um, I think of things that are much more specific, such as a nutritionist, right? A, you know, some sort of fertility or or uh, soil type consultant, right? Uh, if you're a if you're do if you're cropping, um, an agronomist, right? Uh, those subject matter experts. Men a number of us are actually good enough in those areas that we can get by. Um, I have taken graduate level nutrition in college, right? I can mix a ration. I can do all that stuff. I still love nothing more than calling a nutritionist and saying, hey, Kelsey, can you help me with? And boy, it goes a lot smoother. It goes a lot faster. And, and again, she, like Daniel that works for us, is doing it five days a week. So she's up to date on pricing, on any changes, on you know availability, that sort of thing. So I don't know if that that, that certainly doesn't flesh out the whole team. Um, but I think, again, just recognizing that the financial part of that is significantly more complex than most people give it credit for um, is I, I feel like something we've struggled to sort of push a little bit in our industry that that, you know, having mom do your books is fine, but outsourcing it often really is better. Um, and yes, it costs money and it costs often more money. Uh, but most of the time, what you pay out, you get back multiple times. So it doesn't take very much for us to find pieces of your business to just say, oh yeah, and by the way, this savings or the new income produced or the tax savings, whatever, more than pays for our fee for the year. So there we are, we're even. Yeah, Mary Jo was on a few months ago from, from when we're recording this. And yeah, she didn't explicitly talk about that subject. We touched on it a little bit, but yeah, you guys are uh, sharing some 
similar principles and thoughts. And then, so if you haven't listened to that episode, go back because it'll tie nicely to this one as well. But having a team in general, that's something that I talk about a lot on here, whether it is the nutritionist, your veterinarian, um, you know, if you're a seed stock producer doing embryo work or anything like that, it's pulling in those experts because you can't be an expert in anything or in everything. Right. You can be an expert in something, but you can't be an expert in everything. So right. know where your zone of genius is and work there and let other people fill in for you. Yep. Now can, let's expand on this just a little, because this is a topic I just, I find fascinating <laughs> uh, in part because I've been terrible at it for a lot of my okay. career. So, uh, so this is, I, I say this as no criticism of anybody, but me, right. Um, there are different ways to be a business owner in ranching, right? And we can draw a spectrum from a, a business owner who is a single operator, does everything his, him or herself, right? It's great. And then you have the like business owner, like, you know, big business, right? Like, you know, big, big companies that own thousands of acres, right? Have hundreds of employees, et cetera. Those are two very different ends of the spectrum. As the lead of my individual organization, I have to think very clearly about what my role is. And I have to think about what that role is within the context of what is going to help my individual business be the most successful. So if that is me with a thousand head feed yard, I'm the feed buyer, I'm the nutritionist, I'm the daily cattle care, like that's all fine, but I have to make sure that I've identified that role correctly and that I am good at it right? If this business is going to be successful as we, when you go to the other end of the spectrum, right? So think of, uh, you know, a company like the LDS church, right? The, the corporate side of that, the business side, the for-profit side, uh, there is a CEO of that organization, right? Very, very different role one to the other as the chief of that organization. Those are very clear. What's hard is the ones that are in the middle, where we're a we're a two or three man team, right? Maybe we're mom and dad and junior, or we're mom and dad and grandpa, or you know, or a neighbor, or whatever the mix is. There is where it gets muddy. And what we the mistake I feel that we often make is we try to run a three person team the same way we run a one person team or a one person operation. How does that sound? And they're not the same. And the underlying principles are not the same. And the actions we take are not the same. And the things we need are not the same. And as that grows from one person to three people, to five people, to 10 people, those that sort of those roles change very, very quickly. Uh, and, and the impact is very large. I have used, um, Adam Smith talked about specialization as the, uh, what exactly did he say? Specialization is the royal road to riches, I believe is his quote. And uh, he cites an example, right, where we make uh, straight pins for shirts, right? And one one person at that time, right, could make one straight pin every, I don't remember what it was, but they could make a few of them a day, basically. Uh, as soon as you start specializing, then one person makes the head and one person makes the point and one person rolls it out and one person sticks them all together. Their productivity went up like 10,000 fold. I mean, it just totally changes the game. Somebody recently did the same thing on uh, the production of nails. Uh, what does it take to build a nail? And when you have, you know, one person doing it at a time, think hand forge nails, right? It takes forever. And when you have somebody that does this piece and somebody that does that piece, even if it's done by hand, not a machine, right? It becomes a very, very productive process. Ha Ingalls was the classic jack of all trades, right? Uh, I don't know if you grew up watching that like I yep. did, but in the seventies <laughs> and eighties, that was what we watched as a family on television. Uh, Paul Ingalls did it all. He was poor. Right? Paul Ingalls didn't outsource anything, right? We celebrate this wonderful ethic of, you know, work hard, know all these things, do it all yourself, be self-reliant, all those things. Those are all wonderful things, but they are not the most productive way to approach life. If we have, a, we can, I can do my own taxes. I literally can do that. I do not because it is more valuable for me to pay someone else to do that. And, and again, it's not cheap, right? I pay him to do that so that I can do my area, right? So I can do the best job here. Breaking those things into pieces 
um, is very, very important to increasing productivity. Now, we may think that, well, I don't want to do that. I don't need to increase productivity. But at the same time, I hear a lot of people talk about how they're not making enough money. Um, this this idea that you can be a jack of all trades and make a good living um, is probably outdated. Okay, so as we kind of work towards wrapping up this conversation, what resources, whether it's books or software or other people to look at or management models, like what resources can cattle producers go to after they listen to this podcast interview to help improve the finances of their operation or maybe just the business management as a whole? Sure. So let, let, let's go to business management as a whole, um, because I'd like to, I, I want to make a connection from there to the finances. The most important thing I think that people can do right now has nothing to do with software, has nothing to do with the actual day-to-days of their finances. It has entirely to do with de- building, developing, and maintaining the mindset around the fact that you have 100% control over your business and the outcomes that it produces. We are all subject to weather. We are all subject to the market. But I I hear people, for example, say, well, I can't control the market. And while at the global level, that is absolutely correct, I can 100% control what I choose to sell or what I choose to buy. That is my interaction with the market. I have a lot of control over that. I feel like we've spent too much time uh, talking about the things we can't control and not enough time talking about the things that we can. And I feel like an investment in your mentality is the biggest single most important uh, investment you can make. Now you have this mastermind cattle deal, right? That's a lot of what you're doing. The reason why I would learn more about nutrition is because I think that nutrition could have an impact on the outcome. The reason I would learn more about finance and business management is because I have a real belief that it will change the outcome. The people that work with us, our customers, by definition, have defaulted to a point where they have said, we think that knowing about our finances will help us run a better business. If we we have people periodically that come to us and say, well, I need to know this because it's for, you know, I got to have this stuff into my tax accountant. But, you know, I'm pretty much a victim of the market and the weather. Like, those aren't our clients. We don't we do not do that. Like, that's not our thing. Uh, compliance is important. I don't mean to say that. But it comes very much after a fundamental belief that we participate in these activities because we believe they produce outcomes. I'm not going to say disasters don't happen. I mean, we just, in our area, I think you guys were similar, right? We're coming out of three years of drought that was pretty brutal, et cetera. That said, I guarantee you there were people that were very successful through that drought, and there were people that were the opposite. Every day, I am looking for the opportunity to be on the successful side of that coin. You're going to be one or the other. And it is the difference is mentality. It's not luck. It's not genetics. It's not your genetics or your cattle or sheep genetics, right? It, it's oftentimes not even about the specifics of the business. It has entirely to do with the owner's mentality, the owner's ability to pivot, the owner's ability to deal with today. Uh, Bud Williams used to spend a lot of time teaching uh, people about animal handling, as an example, and he, and he tried to break things down into techniques. I am 100% convinced that he he taught techniques. There are correct techniques and there are incorrect techniques. I'm not going to argue that, but I think a lot of it had much more to do Uh, and has much more to do with sort of relationship with animals, right? Just the same way it does with people. We can teach all kinds of, uh, you know, marriage techniques. Well, techniques don't really matter if the relationship is the problem, right? And so, and by relationship, I mean, you know, the sort of cumulative impact of all of the daily little bitty interactions, right? So if I kind of have a sneer on my face every time I address my wife and then turn around and hit her with some great, you know, how to make your wife happy technique, it's probably not going to work, right? It has a lot to do with what is happening over and over again. And I believe mentally, we are making these small pivots uh, each and every day throughout the day, right? We're making choices and our choices essentially, are we the one that's in control of the outcome or are we going to be a victim? 
again, I don't want to cast aspersions on anybody. I think I started this by saying the, the biggest reason I find this interesting is because of my own self, right? Um, this is the place where when we when we make that change, that is the one thing that changes everything else. So then when we have a different mentality and we have more of that creator approach to things um, or a steward approach to things, our accountable approach to things, however you want to describe that, then that allows us to take sort of definitive action that leads us either to a better place or not. And it often allows us to look at the results of that with a much more objective eye that maybe allows us to learn instead of blame. So when I don't make as much money as I think I was going to, do I find, you know, do I blame it on somebody else or do I say, oh, this is the, this is the reason, here's what I can do about it. Off we go. Th does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, it's okay. when you, as a business owner, when you eliminate the victim mentality and approach things with curiosity and a level head and as this succeeded, this failed. Okay. Why? Okay. What can I do to change it? Was it in my control? Was it out of my control? It's a lot easier to move forward with decisions. And I'm speaking on that on a small scale with my own business, but business is business. And those principles can be replicated towards any business from that standpoint. So as we wrap up today, where can people go to find more information about you? Um, is there anything else you'd like to share? You bet. So a couple of things. Uh, let's let me before I get to our website. One of the things that I find really fun and and it extends from that mentality thing is we work with people who are absolutely killing it financially in our industry, and and have been through the last couple of years, which have included a terrible market, droughts, etc. Uh, those, that has been a lot of fun, uh, and, and they are in all cases doing it directly from, uh, you know, directly within the industry. It's not like they've got an oil well and there's outside money pouring in and that's, what's driving the success. So that's a lot of fun. Uh, people can find us on, uh, we, we have had, uh, kind of a wonderful run. We're a couple years old. We are still building this business, trying to learn how it, how it works, how to do it best, et cetera. We have been growing fairly quickly. Uh, we have had a few growing pains along the way. So we get those kind of ironed out and then run into a new one. Uh, but we have a website, uh, www.ranchrightllc.com. And right is spelled like your right hand, not like, yeah, not R-I-T-E, but R-I-G-H-T-E or T. Um, and there you can, if you would like, book a call with us to find out more about how we can help you. We have those fairly throttled right now. It's the middle of summer, so it's not too hard. Uh, but we have those fairly throttled. We we limit the number of new customers that we take to make sure that we can service our existing customers. We continue to build our capacity, so our ability to take new customers uh, and the pace at which we can do it continues to grow. Uh, but we are really trying to make sure that we provide high quality service to the customers that we do have. We have a couple of different levels of service. Uh, depending on kind of where you are in your business cycle or in your business need. Um, and we have, I, I think maybe one of the things that um, also distinguishes us from some other firms like ours is we we have a bit of a focus on education. So we give people financials, which is one part, but what we quickly found was that handing someone a stack of financials and saying, you know, good luck. Hope this let we'll we'll talk next month was kind of inadequate. So we do a monthly webinar uh, where we talk about things specifically related to the financial outputs that we produce. I'm also a part owner of something called Ranching.FYI with Cinnamon Lenhart and Wally Olson. And there we do things more than just financials, but kind of similar to what you're doing, you know, more sort of continuing ed. Uh, in the area of ranching. And we are focused kind of on our particular brand, you know, there of how we do things, uh, but but fairly open. And uh, with the idea that there are a few sort of parallel uh, constructs here, but the biggest one is um, that there is often a big gap between, you know, your stated mission, vision, core values, and then what you do on a daily basis. We're trying to help people tie those things together. Financials are one piece of that. There are a whole bunch of others. All right. Well, John, thank you very much for joining me today and uh, sharing your expertise and advice to those cattle producers out there. 
You're welcome. Thanks for having me, Shem. I'm super honored that you called. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.